This is the opening of my novel, Peculiar Pioneer. I'm Howard W. Robertson. My problem was I was caught between my mother's world and my father's. My whole life would be the story of that. The earliest memories I have of my mother are of the tenderness of her touch, of the heavenly blue of her eyes and the angelic sweetness of her smile, of the way her hugs and caresses took away all agitation and suffering from my toddler's heart. I close my eyes these many years later and I can hear even now the Ahadaset lullabies she would sing to me as I lay snugly tucked into my bed under the thick Hudson's Bay Company blankets. I learned to sing these songs myself and would ask her for their meaning in English. A little otter with its belly poking up, up above the water. You are my little otter with belly above the water, she would chant melodiously in her native tongue. Or, I suppose you will be a whale person stealing harpoons from the big whaling canoes. Or, my little seal hunter, my little man, you will be a slayer of bull seals. Or, you are paddling far out to sea, my little warrior. You are paddling in a great war canoe, my little man. She told me wondrous tales, too, as soon as I was old enough to understand, or rather told the same tale over and over, using different animals, but with the same main characters. I'd beg her for a story, for the one story again, and she'd tell me about the walruses, or the sea lions, or the killer whales. The openings would vary a bit, but the endings in my mother's versions would always involve the little daughter of sea eagle or frog or bear asking her mother if her father would ever come home. What do you think, Isaac, she'd ask me. Will the father of Octopus Girl ever come back to her? She'd look hopefully into my eyes as she asked me the same question again. I always said yes. I thought her father would return. My answer never failed to make her very happy. Mother told me the story of how her own father left her, and it was as strange a tale as the animal stories. He was a young Englishman, a King George man, as she called him. He sailed into the harbor at Nutka on a big ship. I later learned this was in March of 1803. His name was John Jewett. The captain of the ship insulted the chief of the Nutkins, and a terrible massacre took place. All the Englishmen were killed except for my grandfather. He was taken prisoner because he was a blacksmith, and the Nutkins could use his ironworking skills. He became the slave of Chief McQuenna and spent his time making knives and repairing muskets. His abilities were so appreciated that, even though a slave, he was allowed to marry a chief's daughter from a tribe nearby the Ahadasats. Her name was Eustochiexqua, which meant Dawn. She was my grandmother. Dawn told my mother about her time with the Englishman, and later on my mother told me. The new married couple were assigned a separate apartment in McQuinna's great longhouse, the chief's palace. The two of them got along very well and were most happy together. John's years of work as a blacksmith had given him a strong build, and Don loved his touch, the combination of power and gentleness in his hands. She was fascinated by the blueness of his eyes, unknown among her people. She was charmed by the kindliness of his disposition and the cheerfulness that was natural to him. Her affection for him grew rapidly and soon knew no bounds. His marriage to a chief's daughter, the equivalent of a princess, improved his social standing to the point that he even now had his own slaves, though he himself remained the slave of McQuinna. My dear wife, I love you more than I thought I could, grandfather would say, and their blissful life together would stretch out before her into the boundless future. One fine summer day, another King George ship dropped anchor at Nutka. This was in July 1805, as I later learned from my grandfather's own published account. Chief McQuinna told his slave John to write a letter to the ship's captain describing the kindly treatment the chief had provided his English captain and praising the sterling qualities of the Nutkin leader. 
What my grandfather actually wrote was somewhat different, as follows. To the captain of the brig in Nootka Harbor, Sir, the bearer of this letter is the Indian king by the name of McQuinnah. He was the instigator of the capture of the ship Boston, of Boston in North America, John Salter, captain, and of the murder of 25 men of her crew. Wherefore, I hope you will take care to confine him according to his merits, keeping so good a watch over him that he cannot escape from you. By so doing, I shall be able to obtain my release in the course of a few hours. John R. Jewett, Armorer of the Boston. When McQuinnah arrived on board the brig and handed the note to the captain, the great chief was immediately thrown into irons. A message was sent to the village that he could be ex exchanged for the Englishman. The Nutkins were furious but complied. Don't go to the ship, husband, Don pleaded. Tell the captain you don't want to leave this place. By this time she was pregnant with my mother. It's true, I don't want to leave, my dear. I never want to part from you, was grandfather's reply. I like to believe it wasn't completely a lie. I'll just go to the ship and make it plain that I want to stay here of my own free will. They won't release our chief otherwise. Unless they hear it from me directly, they won't believe I don't choose to go with them. Don't worry, beloved, have trust in me. They embraced and kissed long and tenderly. She accompanied her husband to the canoe and watched as the paddlers propelled it from the shore. It was the last time she ever saw him. McQuinnah was returned, and the brig sailed away with John Jewett. Mother never knew her father, but she thought of him often and dreamed of his returning for her. She grew up in the longhouse of the Ahadaset chief and was treated like a princess herself, just like her mother. Her name was Yama, then, which meant Salalberry, but I always knew her as Sally, the name she took later on in my father's house. Except for her deep and frequent longing for her own missing father, her early years were spent in enchanted contentment, and she had implicit confidence in her happy life in her village. Then one sunny morning in August of 1820, she went out berry picking near the seashore. The sky was blue, the breeze was so gentle, and the balmy weather held her close like a mother's embrace. She surrendered to the pleasure of the moment and confidently followed the ripe little berries where they led her, becoming ever more isolated as she did so. Just as she was reaching as high as she could for a plump fruit, she felt strong hands grab her from behind and a rough hand clamp itself over her mouth. Be still or die, a gruff voice commanded. You understand? She could tell by his speech that the speaker wasn't a Hadassat. He was, as it turned out, a Tlaoquiat from further south down the coast of Vancouver Island. She conveyed her intention to obey and thus was allowed to live. The small group of Tlaoquiat men bound her wrists and ankles tightly with bark rope and put a dirty wad of European cloth in her mouth securing it there with the bark rope that chafed her cheeks. They loaded her in one of their canoes and took her back south with them. Eventually, she wound up at Cape Flattery, where she was traded to the Macaws for 70 dentalia, the shells that served for money there. The Macaws, in turn, took her further south and traded her to the Chinooks for 15 American wool blankets. The Chinooks took her to the mouth of the Columbia River. And by mid-September of, of that same year, my mother had become one of the many slaves in the longhouse of the great chief, come calmly.